Anyway, so Race of the Galaxy is one of those board games that is, well, a card game, actually, sort yep. of. Yep, it is but a tabletop game. It is one of those, like, staple games that, like, has cemented itself in the tabletop board game culture and is, like, always there. in every game library. Everyone knows how to play it. It's up there with Settlers, Carcassonne, Dominion, right? Race of the Galaxy is, like, up there as one of those games that will always be there. Yep, it's, bunch of expansions. There's right. apps. There's, there's apps, tournaments, expansions. It's, there's Roll for the Galaxy that is basically the same game with dice instead of cards. It's not as good. Uh, I think it's better. But anyway, I don't think so. But anyway, we're only talking about Race of the Galaxy today. So And it's expansions to a degree. Yeah, so the deal with Race of the Galaxy is it's a lot like Puerto Rico, actually. Yeah. Right? Every round... Every in, in Puerto Rico, you take turns choosing what's going to happen. Like, I'm going to captain, and Scott says, right. well, I'm going to craft. Right, so when Rim captains, he captains super captain because he chose it, but everyone else, just regular captains, right? In Race of the Galaxy, everyone chooses at the same time, and people can actually choose the same thing as each other, yep. right? And you can just choose the same thing over and over again. But if you choose trade, you do super trading, but now everyone else gets to do regular trading. If they also chose trading... Because two people might choose the same thing. Everyone could choose the same thing. Yeah. Then it's a pain any, in the ass when that happens. Anyone who chooses does super version of that task, but everyone else gets to do regular version. So sometimes you get to do everything because everyone chose something different, and sometimes you don't get to do very much because everyone chose the same thing. Now that's already a huge, huge difference from Puerto Rico because in Puerto Rico, I choose a role. And then the next player, so Scott, ha knows what I that. chose, can't choose that, and decides based on... So every role you choose informs the decisions, but also restricts the decisions of all the further players. Right. In Race of the Galaxy, you're trying to guess, ooh, I want, I really need trading to happen. But, but I don't want to pick it. I don't. The benefit of picking trading... Like, it's trading you have to pick. You can't trade unless you pick it. Oh, right, right, right. But, okay, I really want to settle right now, yep. right? But the benefit of settling is only a minor benefit. It's like a one discount or something, right? Yep. It's like, I don't need the discount. I'm good. I just need to, but I do want to settle. So I want settling to happen, but I really don't want to have to play settle because it would also be nice if produce happened this turn. Yeah, I want to produce, I, and I hope that so Scott settles and that Joey Rim, and JoJo explores. Is Rim going to produce? If he produces, then I can just settle. I, well, I need to settle if he produces, but... If he's, I think he's going to settle, which is great, so I'm going to produce. And then you really hope you can guess what other people are going to do. And this psychological element is the number one fun, great thing about Race of the Galaxy. I played a game that I remember to this day where the game started, and in the first two rounds, nobody picked settle. Everyone picks explore in the early rounds. Everyone picked explore, develop, predict, like other stuff, mm -hmm. two, two times in a row. Except military guy. So event uh, even military guy. Whoa. So eventually, so two rounds have Bad gone draw, by. Military guy. No one has settled. Like couple people built like a development, mm -hmm. and everyone assumes now because everyone's got a pile of cards in their hands except one jerk that someone's gonna pick settle. No one picks it. No one picks it. They kept trying to mooch off someone else. We went six rounds what? where no one picked set colonizer everyone, settle. Uh, were your hands really shitty or what? Well, people like people did developments instead. Oh, okay. Or other stuff, but no one settled. No worlds were put out right. on the seventh round. Everyone picked settle. Everyone except one person picked settle. The smart a winner. <laughs> that person. <laughs> but that happens a lot, and that is a big fun part of this game. The other right. part of this game. But that and that's the most like there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on in the game, but that aspect of that where that part beginning of the turn where you choose what you're gonna do and you're trying to guess what the other people are gonna choose. That is like more than 50% of the fun strategy and quality in this game. And that's why it's fun to play over and over and over and over and over again. Just doing that thing over and over again is so great. Yep. I don't, get, game, I don't get tired of that aspect. And the game is, if you look at it, if you've never played it before, it looks terrifyingly bullshitty complex. Like right. It looks like the most ridiculous nonsense game that you will do anything to avoid playing with some guy at a con. The thing is, this game isn't actually that complex as far as games go. It, it is com too complex for a complete beginner, but it is not, oh, as things go, it's not advanced squad leader. It's not even, yeah. as, it's easier than Eclipse. It's easier than a lot of games, right? What, like, it's a game that it takes forever to teach someone who's never played games before, right. but once you start playing, by like two rounds in, they're like, oh, okay. Right. So okay. the, the main thing is that the cards have so much information on them, but the information is coded in all these various symbols. And what the symbols mean isn't really that crazy, but you have to learn to read the symbols 
maybe and the graphic design it's like maybe you could do better to make the learning easier but i can't imagine a way you could i think they've done it as good as they can some of these symbols are shockingly complex but if you really look at them they actually make a lot of sense like once you look up what a symbol means you're like oh that's what that does that makes perfect sense Trade any good for one, one victory point and one card right it's like oh it makes perfect sense so you had to learn to read these symbols, and that makes getting into the game a little bit difficult. The first times you play it, you're going to be constantly like looking at the book and asking people who know, like, what does this card do? What does that symbol mean? What I mean, is the this? summary card that comes with the game looks terrifying. Yeah. Uh, at least there is a summary card, which helps you out, right? But, you're, uh, the, but the summary is, card doesn't really... Once you learn to read the symbols, and you don't need the summary card anymore... The game is almost strangely like a solitaire thing, right? Where yeah. there's you interact at that fun part that I mentioned, the good part, where you choose the role that you're going to do that turn or the activity, whatever, the action. And that's the interactive part with the other players. But other than that, like once everyone chooses an action, everyone just sort of goes, okay, and does their own thing. Yep. And like you don't even you might not even be paying attention to what the other people are doing. You should because then you learn how to, you know. But you can pay vague attention like Scott played another green uh Windfall World, okay. Right. Uh-oh, Joey Jojo got a more military. I better watch out. He might try to end the game quicker. Right, but it's like, you know, you don't have to like super, you know, n normally in a game everyone does their turn and says everything they're doing and you see every action they do and the next person goes. And race you can play fast when everyone knows what they're doing because everyone just sort of does their own shit simultaneously. And then you can sort of look at some, you can look at everyone's boards. They're all public. You can very similar. You don't to need to see what they did. You just need to look at their board state to get all the information you need to make your own decisions. It's actually very similar among skilled players to how Seven Wonders tends to play out. Yep. You, you know, you pass, you look at other people's boards to say, oh, okay, I'll pick this card. But then. Once your turn happens, you're like, all right, I'm building this. I'm taking these points. Here's money. Here's money. Give me money. Okay, good. Yep. But the symbology of this game is way better than Seven Wonders. Yeah, Seven Wonders does have that similar problem to learn the language of the symbols. But I find that in Seven Wonders, uh, I have to keep looking things up every time I play it. Partly because they, they, there's too many mechanics that are really weird, especially when you add all the expansions. Right. In Race of the Galaxy, they're just sort of combining the same symbolic language over and over, and cards that need it just have words on them. Yep. A lot of the fancy development cards just have words on them to explain themselves, so you don't, you know, you don't need to look anything up. So yep. I do need to look things up when there's new things or an expansion or the few really crazy cards but it's a lot less common than Seven Wonders. You start off like, oh, these leaders, got to look them up Yep. every time. Now, the game, Unexpanded, is fun, but it's got maybe, maybe 20 plays right, so before it, the game is complete random nonsense. You know, there is, you don't make any decisions. The game right. is so simple. So the game, in the, in the, just the core set, the Race of the Galaxy box, doesn't have a lot of cards in it. So... Once you have played it a bunch to the point at which you don't need to look up symbols anymore, it, it just gets really repetitive. Like you're seeing the same cards over and over again. You know exactly what to do on your turn. It's sort of pre you're not making interesting decisions anymore, which is why it's good that that exists so that a new player can get into the game easily like that. But anyone who's played this enough or is it playing it semi seriously or is a somewhat hardcore tabletop gamer like us, you have to combine a whole bunch of expansions in there to get a whole bunch of extra cards to mix things up and keep it exciting at the replay value. Yep. And so, which is good because there's a lot of expansions. Well, there are two main expansions. I don't know what other expansions there are because these are the ones that I've played. I haven't played any beyond Yeah, you this. want at least these two main ones especially, but there are other ones. Yep, The Gathering Storm and Rebel vs. Imperium. Right. You, need, now, you basically need those. Like, if you're buying this game and you... Like, I recommend not buying it if you haven't played it, right? Play it. And if you like it and think you're going to play it a lot, Buy it and those two expansions all together. Yep. Now, be warned, the expansions add more cards, and they actually make the game way better, Like especially just Gathering Storm. That's the minimum, mm -hmm. because that makes the game start way less random. Yep. Because once you play the original enough, the start, the random, like what you start with, determines the whole game, and there's almost no way back from that initial set. Mm -hmm. But with Gathering Storm, you have some sort of, you can tune what you want to do, what strategy you want to go, to a small degree when you start the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only real bad expansion, I think, because there's like some goals and other things. There was that one added. that came out that I haven't played too much. That had like a board with alien guys moving around on the board or something, right? There's like a scenario that in uh, Rebel versus Imperium that I am not interested in at all. Mm. Uh, and more importantly, it adds a mechanic that I think is actually pretty bad. 
around actually attacking other players and taking their shit. Mm. I feel like that that that's not good because then suddenly you, you can't, that whole solitaire element goes away where you start to have to really think about what other people are that doing. That is and just like, as bad as Carcassonne expansions that let you knock other people's meeples off the board. Yeah, like that is bad news. I so it's like, like not all the expansions for this game are good, but the good thing is that a lot, even the bad expansion, like the one with the miniature board where guys move it around. It also just on the has map, a bunch of cards. It just has a bunch of cards in it, so you can buy the expansions and not use all of the rules that they come with and not. Use all of the garbage in there, and like it's like buying a Carcassonne expansion and just taking the tiles and not using those. Like you can buy, we bought what the tower. We bought the tower. We, we don't, don't use, use the, the tower. tower. We just added a bunch of tiles to the Carcassonne, right? So you can buy Race of the Galaxy expansion and just add a bunch of cards. Uh, and you're not gonna be able to add all the cards. We're gonna be able to add most of them and get mix up your game and get some interesting things happening without having to use all of the extra weirdo garbage in there. I guess the, the most interesting thing about this game, I mean, we didn't get too much into the mechanics because it's better if you just learn the game. Uh, the mechanics are pretty simple. It's like you're basically, you're getting cards. Cards are planets. But cards are, cards also, are currency. also currency. So cards are everything. Right. Cards are everything. So it's like you want to build this planet that costs four. Well, discard four other cards. It doesn't matter what they are, just cards. And you hope you draw, when you want to draw cards, because drawing more cards gives you A, more options, but B, more currency to actually play some cards that are more expensive, right? And then you planets produce things, so they get goods on them. Yep, can, some do, some don't. You can turn goods into victory points. Some only produce things once when you build them and never again. Some planets are military. And then there's developments, which do fancy stuff and get victory points. And basically, all the abilities on these cards enhance your regular abilities. So it's like, oh, this card has a thing that happens when you produce. So from now on, every time produce happens, you can do the fancy thing on this card and you're basically upgrading your machine, and your machine is made of planets and goods and yep. development. So again, like Puerto and Rico, and when someone reaches a certain number of cards in front of them, well, there's two ways. So the just game like, is over. And also in Puerto Rico, there's an end race of the galaxy. There's a pile of victory point chits. If you run that out, the if game you run, also ends. If you run out the chit pile of victory points, the game ends, and then you see who has the highest score. So who, just who like Puerto the, Rico, who built the best machine and got the most points and cranked this, it in, efficiently in the same number of turns. Yep. And in that aspect, that's of like, why it's a race. It's a race in strategy. The strategies of this game are shockingly similar to the kinds of thinking you do in Puerto Rico as well. Mm -hmm. Like, are you going to build goods and ship them for victory points? Are you going to build a bunch of fancy planets and developments to get your victory points that way? You can legit win the game. Never shipping stuff. And you can legit win the game pretty much doing nothing but shipping stuff and just building planets. You can try to end the game quickly by with like military especially, just getting planet, 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 planet if you get a good draw. Yep. Right? Just get fill up the you know victory point condition and just end. Right? There's a lot of different things you can do in the game. And, you look, and this is why it's not you just have solitaire. To, you have to look at what other people are doing. You have to make good decisions. And there's also an element uh, that Puerto Rico doesn't have of luck. Right, If you start with the military world, New Sparta, and you draw a military world that you can just get right away, and then you draw another one that you, get, you can get right away, you can just roll through the game. But if you draw a bunch of other kinds of things that military isn't helping you with, it's just like you can sit there and slog, where yep. someone else who maybe started with a blue world and draws a bunch of blue worlds to go with it and gets a, a hand full of synergies is going to take off. And so even if you're really good at the game... You won't win all the time against other people who are good at the game. And if everyone's good at the game... It's a card game. Like, the better you all get at the game, the more the randomness influences the winner, because the game... Which is why you want to have more cards, because then, even though you think more cards make it more random, it does... But more cards also means there's more cards to go around. So yep. it's not like, oh, you got the only thing that I needed to win because there's only one of those in the game. It's like, oh, now there's a huge fucking deck of cards. There's going to be some other cards I can get, even if someone took those ones. But not, like, I'm not just getting blocked Among out. skilled players, that randomness is a big factor, partly because the game will be shockingly tight. I would say... Oh, yeah. 10 to 20 percent of all the games i play of this have at least two players who are tied at the end of the game oh yeah if people are really who know what they're doing are playing uh properly in fact you guys saw scores I tweeted it. are really really close i was playing the app while i was pooping a four-player game against the hardest ai it was a four-way perfect tie mm -hmm. like that happens in this game shockingly often even that you think it's like it's so complex all the shit you're doing all over the place but everyone's doing mostly the same actions because they're all sharing the actions yep. And you're drawing from the same decks, and you're taking the same exact number of turns. 
So the same number of victory points per turn on average, you can get ties even though you have these complex machines being built if everyone's doing a good job. But the game is also so tight that, like, if you have one, against skilled players, if you have one turn where, like, you did a suboptimal thing, like, you're, you didn't you're quite behind now, your you're not going to catch up. Yeah, you're done. You're, you're out unless everyone else fucks up bad. At the same token, if you have one mega play, like, oh my god, I somehow managed to build this really amazing development yep. way, way early. I did an X2 trade way early and got like 12 victory points. Like, oh my god, over. I was able, I, I was able, this, I traded and sold this good at like this crazy high price and drew a fistful of cards on a turn where no one else was able to trade anything. You know, and it's just like, whoa, I guess I'm in charge, I'm in, I'm in the lead now. Good luck catching up, bozos. Yep. This game also kind of pushes the envelope in terms of for a tabletop card game, you play it really fast. Like it, and but it it's fast, but it also really pushes the limit of the acceptable level of complexity you can have in a game like this. Mm. It is really surprising how fast it plays, considering how complex it is. Right, it's like you're getting a pretty, you know, it's not super deep, but you're getting a significant gaming experience in a short amount of time with a minimal investment of setup because it's just dealing out cards pretty yep. much and counting some chits or whatever, right? And that's why this game has, is a staple of that game library, right? Yep, especially because once you break it out, you put it on the table, you play it once, you can sit there and play it like six more times before you put it away and like just keep it play over and over and over again. It's so quick. And the other thing is it starts out, this game will start out when you're first playing it as like the meat game, right? You'll warm up with a spot it and then go into a race of the galaxy. But once you get good, you can use this as a filler game in between your eclipses, right? Yeah. It's just like, because you can play it so fast. And now your filler game is a serious game. It's like, whoa. That's pretty. I I because I, Nurshim Max is kind of done. Like I I think I've played it a hundred percent out. That's but that's another that takes more setup, right? If you're not doing the digital. Yep. Version. But now that there's a good app on Android for Race for the Galaxy, this is my pooping game. Mm -hmm. I can play an entire fully expanded game of this. In one poop, like as the, fast as the Nurishima Hex. The next time I need a phone game, I think I might buy it or see, wait for it to be on sale or something. And it's I'm, totally I'll worth it. I'll make it my pooping game as well. But the fact that you can play so many games at the table... Let me see how much it is right now on the iPad. Kind of, kind of mitigates the randomness because, yeah, there's a lot of randomness and the game's tight. But if we sit down at PAX, we'll play it five times. So the better player is going to win the majority of those games, much more likely, even if they lose one due to randomness. So... This game's got a lot going for it. There's a reason it has so much staying power. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music.